Hi everyone, this is Yvonne Salander from the Somerset County Library System, bringing you part three of the Virtual Book Lovers Tea. Today I'll be talking about life, so contemporary and historical fiction. And we're gonna start with some modern tales. A Burning by Megha Majumdar. An act of terrorism kills 104 people on a train and the community needs justice. Javon is a young woman from the slums obsessed with getting likes on social media, so she said something to get herself noticed. She is noticed and accused of sedition and terroristic acts. P.T. Sir is a gym teacher where Javon went to school. To assist a political candidate, he regularly helps put bad people in jail by providing testimony at all of their trials as a witness. Lovely, a transgender woman, was learning English from Javon so she could improve her chances of becoming a successful actress. Can she speak against the girl who helped her when so few would? This is a character study examining what people will do to be noticed, seen, and understood, to have their worth recognized at the expense of others, and how the misfortune of one begins to seem justified in the minds of those who benefit from their misery. The Care and Feeding of Ravenously Hungry Girls by Anissa Gray. After the death of their mother, Althea stepped up to raise her younger siblings, Viola, Joe, and Lillian. She resented the role of caregiver, but took on the role with varying levels of success. Soon after she was of age, she married Proctor, and the two had twin daughters and started a grocery and restaurant. The businesses were doing well until the industry and town began to dry up. Althea and Proctor turned to illegal ways to survive and were existing under the radar until one of their daughters reported them to authorities. Now Althea and Proctor are in jail awaiting sentencing and Lillian and Viola are stepping up to try to raise their nieces. This is a story about family. While incarceration does play a large part of the story, it's also about the interplay between family members and how difficult it is to be a family. I wouldn't call this a dysfunctional family, I would call it a damaged one. Each member is trying to heal themselves while taking on the responsibilities of other members of this family unit. It's also about the bonds that can be created between people who are not biologically family, but become more important than your own blood relatives. This Town Sleeps by Dennis E. Staples. Marion Lafournier once left the Ojibwe Reservation in northern Minnesota, but found himself drawn back. He hooks up with men in dark places around the reservation, and he's fine with the relationships beginning and ending in the backseat of a car until one night when he meets up with Shannon. Marion and Shannon went to school together, and Shannon is positive he is not gay. Marion is used to guys who can't accept who they are, but this time it bothers him because he's starting to have feelings for Shannon. Marion is Ojibwe by birth, but not belief. He doesn't have an Ojibwe name given to him by a medicine man, and he doesn't buy into many of the Ojibwe beliefs, but he's starting to embrace that side of himself. Part mystery, part cultural study, and part coming of age just a little bit late, this is a great character study of a gay man who thinks he accepts himself, but learns how to accept every last part of his being. When We Were Vikings by Andrew David McDonald. Zelda wants to be a legend. She knows things aren't right with her older brother and guardian Gert, but she doesn't quite know what to do about it. So she consults her books on Viking lore and draws up a list of what she needs to do to be a hero. Zelda is on the fetal alcohol spectrum and interacts with friends on all levels of the spectrum, as well as colleagues and patrons at the library where she becomes employed. Zelda is highly functioning and does not present the physical characteristics of a person with FAS. So her cognitive abilities are sometimes overestimated, but usually underestimated, especially by herself. While there are doses of humor, this is actually a pretty bleak and realistic look at a family teetering on the edge. It's also the story of a woman finding the strength inside herself to take risks and try things she never thought herself capable of. In Five Years by Rebecca Searle. Danny Cohen is one of those hyper-organized, highly focused, completely together people who has a plan for her entire life and sticks to it. The night of her interview at the firm of her dream, she's asked the dreaded question, where do you see yourself in five years? 
Danny, being Danny, has the perfectly worded response. But as she dozes that night, she's a dream so real, it seems like a vision. She sees herself in bed in an apartment in Brooklyn, kissing a man that is most definitely not her perfect fiance. What is going on? Danny tells no one about her vision, not even her best friend forever, Bella. Bella is a carefree, free spirit that Danny is always a bit concerned for. Bella tends to fall in love and fall hard, but she also seems to bounce back up and continue living a life she loves, even though she doesn't have any sort of plan in mind. As the five years go by, we follow Danny and Bella as we see how life unfolds and if this vision is gonna become a reality. This is a story about love, but it's not a love story. This is a story about life as well as a life story. This is a novel that's gonna stay with you for a long time and make you smile as well as ugly cry despite convincing yourself that you won't. Now let's take a step back in time with some historical fiction. The Clergyman's Wife by Molly Greeley. This is the story of Charlotte Lucas, who became Charlotte Collins after both Jane and Elizabeth Bennet refused the offer of marriage from their cousin, William Collins. Charlotte saw what may have been her only opportunity for marriage and therefore not becoming a burden to her family in Mr. Collins's proposal. Charlotte doesn't love her husband. She finds his rambling sermons and obsessive devotion to his patroness, Lady Catherine de Berg, tedious at best, but she knows he's a good man and not marrying him, she would have been left a spinster at the mercy of her family and their various fortunes. Then Charlotte meets a local farmer, Mr. Travis. Could she finally be getting a glimpse at love? Retellings of Pride and Prejudice are typically focused on the Bennett family and household. This is the first one I know of that Charlotte is the main character. In this novel, we get under Charlotte's skin and get to feel the bittersweet pangs of unrequited love. She's a strong woman, a survivor, and one that's determined to make a better life, a life of choices for her young daughter. How Much These Hills is Gold by C. Pam Zhang. Ma journeyed here from across the ocean as a young woman. Ba was born here. Lucy and Sam were also born here. Yet they are all constantly asked who their people are and where they're from because they look so different from the other people settling the West, mining and prospecting for gold. At the start of the novel, Lucy and Sam are alone and they're trying to find home, whatever that means, and surviving off the land. Their story and the story of their family's past is slowly uncovered as well as the harsh realities of living in the American West. Every time I thought I knew where the story was going, I was wrong. Every time I thought I knew the whole story, I was wrong. I enjoyed being wrong. What makes a home a home? This book explores what that means for each member of this family. Florence Adler Swims Forever by Rachel Beanland. It's Atlantic City in 1934, and this summer, the Adlers are joined by their granddaughter and a young woman from Germany who's waiting for her college year to start. Florence is able to swim in her beloved Atlantic Ocean daily in preparation for her swim across the English Channel, and her elder sister, Franny, is able to rest in the hospital awaiting the birth of her second child. Disaster strikes, and the family makes the difficult decision to keep Florence's death from Franny. Franny already miscarried one child. No one wants to risk her losing another baby. Can the family, can Atlantic City keep such a big secret? The story is told by all the members of the household, which adds depth and perspective to the narrative. I was especially taken by the storyline of Anna, the girl from Nazi Germany, and how desperately she and Joseph, the elder Adler, worked to secure visas for her parents. It seems that Anna and Joseph are two of the few people who understand how hazardous being Jewish in Germany at that time truly is. Stories are reaching America, but they seem just too awful to be true. At the core, this is a story of a summer, an unusual one, and family dynamics during times of crisis. The Henna Artist by Alka Josie. Lakshmi is the most successful henna artist in Jaipur, decorating the hands and feet of wealthy women of the city. She's hoping to start arranging marriages as well and is eagerly awaiting word of a palace introduction. Her home, 
a rarity for a woman on her own, is nearing completion, and all seems to be progressing as Lakshmi is planned and saved for for more than a decade. Then Ratha, the younger sister she didn't even know existed, arrives from her hometown with the husband Lakshmi fled years before. If you enjoy fiction with a strong female character, you need to meet Lakshmi. She's a shrewd businesswoman, intelligent, and she can read people very well. The one thing she can't do well, communicate with her teenage sister. Ratha is such a teenager, it hurts to experience her swirling emotions because by turns you're empathizing with her and with her older sister. To say Ratha turned Lakshmi's life upside down is a gigantic understatement. This book transports the reader into 1950s Jaipur and the sights, smells, and tastes of the land. The audiobook is a joy, and the ending will leave you smiling after the pages of heartache before. And since it's 2020, I think we all need some feel-good books. These are not the saccharinely sweet ones that will hurt your teeth. These are books that will just kind of give you the warm fuzzies. The Operator by Gretchen Berg. As Vivian Dalton's grandma always said, be careful what you wish for. It's 1952 and Vivian works for Bell Telephone as an operator. And in Worcester, Ohio, if you wanna make a phone call, you have to get connected by an operator like Vivian. Vivian prides herself on knowing people. One of the reasons she knows so much is because she, like many of her fellow operators, don't hang up after they connect their calls. They listen in, hoping to get some good gossip. Vivian listens in one day, hoping to get some new tidbits about the town's wealthy mean girl. Instead, she learns something about her own life that's gonna really throw a monkey wrench in her plans. Dear Emmy Blue by Leah Lewis. On a particularly awful day, teenager Emmy Blue releases a balloon with a secret and her email address into the sky from a short town in England. Days later, she receives a reply from Lucas, a boy in France. The two strike up a deep friendship and 14 years later, he has news for her that he has to tell her in person. Emmy's hoping it's gonna be a confession of love, but it turns out to be a request for her to be the best woman at his upcoming wedding. Emmy has been so infatuated with Lucas and the kismet of their meeting that she's basically ignored all the other relationships in her life. Whenever Lucas needs her, she hurries off to France. But what's she been missing at home? His upcoming marriage finally spurs her to re-examine and reevaluate her life, and she discovers a lot about Emmy Blue. While a romance does develop, the novel focuses on one woman's self-examination and unraveling the truth she held that may not necessarily be the actual truth. I loved watching this character overcome her past, her negligent mother, and her preconceptions to stand on her own two feet. Anxious People by Frederick Bachman. A desperate bank robber holds up a bank in Sweden for 6,500 krona, but the robber walked into a cashless bank. Terrified by police sirens, the robber panics and flees into the first building they see, an apartment building across the street. They run to the top floor and into an open doorway, right into the middle of an apartment showing. Who holds an apartment showing on the day before New Year's Eve? A failed bank robbery is now a hostage situation, and the people in this apartment are the worst hostages ever. In a word, delightful. The writing is quirky, fresh and fun, and the characters are just the same. Add in a father-son policeman duo, and you have the makings of the strangest hostage situation ever. A study in relationship dynamics that's actually going to make you wish that you were at this showing the day before New Year's Eve. The Love Story of Missy Carmichael by Beth Morey. 79-year-old Millicent Carmichael lives each day hoping that something interesting will happen, so she has a reason to email her son, Alistair. But nothing ever does. Until the day she goes walking in the park and a harried mother with a thick Irish accent and her young son stop to chat. A tentative date is made to meet again in a week to watch all the fish in the pond get shocked and stunned so they can get moved to another pond. Well, it's something to do at least. And although odd, it's something interesting to email her son about. The date is set, and to Missy's surprise, the young mother and son show up. So begins one friendship that spirals into another, and another, 
and another. Missy's calendar is filling up. She ends up taking in a dog for a woman she's never met, inviting people into her home, and now she has lots of things to write her son about. Fair warning, a dog is the main character in this book. As readers, we unfortunately know what that means. Aside from that, this book is a joy, a character study in the year of a life of a woman recreating herself. It feels good to witness a person grow and mend broken relationships, including the one with herself later in life. The Big Finish by Brooke Fossey. Here's another story in this new coming of old genre. It's a thing, I swear. A man called Uva started it. Missy Carmichael is on board with it, but I think Carl and Duffy in The Big Finish, they really do finish it. It's great to have some coming of old fiction coming out of the United States for a change. Carl and Duffy are roomies at the Centennial, and they've been that way for quite a few years. They love their home, but the new owner seems to be wanting to get her residents moved to the local nursing home so she can slowly renovate the place and charge more. So they're all on their best behavior, abiding by all the rules, and being as healthy as possible. Until Carl's granddaughter shows up climbing through the window. Duffy is mighty confused because he knows Carl and his late wife never had any children. But it becomes obvious that this young lady has troubles only Duffy can help fix. Looks like Duffy, at age 88, is going to do something he never thought he would again. He's going to have an adventure. I fell in love with Duffy. He's a great guy. He's gruff, brash, and has a heart of gold. The book touches on serious subjects like life, death, growing old and getting dry, but in a lighthearted way. I don't know how the author managed it, but there were tears rolling down my cheeks and a smile on my lips when I turned the last page. So thank you for joining me this week. Please tune in next week for thrillers and mysteries. Until then, be safe and happy reading.